Let's talk about gripping long swords in the 15th century and gauntlets. Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now, first up, uh, we're going to be looking specifically in this video at uh, Milanese, so-called Milanese, actually, we should say Italian style mitten gauntlets from the, um, let's say, the mid of the 15th, middle of the 15th century. They actually turn up about 1430 and carry on all the way through into the 16th century. But these are the uh, famous style of so-called Milanese gauntlets as seen on the Avant um, harness in Glasgow and such like. These are uh, some new gauntlets that I've just received from um, Art of Steel, link below to them. And these are um, hardened carbon steel and they are for me doing poleaxe fighting in my armour. So quite simply these have been specifically ordered for me to use uh, poleaxes, not uh, this uh, sharp one here, but some uh, wooden and uh, rubber ones uh, that we can actually wallop each other with um, in armour. So a new pair of gauntlets for me, very much needed and very good protection, hardened steel. Um, these are these type of gauntlets offer pretty much the optimum, the highest level of protection that you're going to find in the 15th century for gauntlets. And for that reason, they were absolutely used with pole arms but they come at a cost. They come with some drawbacks. So let's just have a very brief look at these up close. You will notice that they have a long cuff that is actually angled on the inside. This means that you have a fair degree actually of wrist um, rotation and mobility while the cuff overlaps the van brace or arm armor uh, up to a fair degree. So to the outside, they've got quite a lot of protection. They've got slightly less protection on the inside, obviously, but that does enable you uh, to move your arms in various ways that you need to, to manipulate and use weapons. Perhaps for the uh, Italian knight who, who wanted these gauntlets, most importantly, to be able to couch the lance um, on the lance rest underneath the armpit. So uh, you need a certain degree of flexation in the wrist in that direction. Now, um, that being said, there are certainly types of cuff which offer a greater uh, degree of mobility than these do. For example, so-called hourglass gauntlets, which were used throughout the 14th century, or certainly for most of the 14th century, and they were still being used uh, pretty much most of the way through the 15th century as well, certainly in places like England. So with um, hourglass gauntlets, you have less protection in general, slightly less protection on the cuff. Uh, they're smaller cuffs, in other words, but you have a greater degree of uh, wrist mobility with them. And of course, less mass because the cuffs are smaller. But the really noticeable difference are the uh, mittens, the the fingers, so to speak. Now, in the 14th century, pretty much all gauntlets had individual finger plates. And indeed, individual finger plate gauntlets continue right the way through the 15th century and into the 16th century, into the 17th century, in fact. But mitten gauntlets offer a higher degree of protection in general against very heavy strikes from things like pole axes or other types of pole arm like bills and halberds, and indeed two-handed swords as well. But there is a middle ground as well. There were um, what we call half mittens, where the mitten came halfway down and then you had fingers beyond that. You get some of the advantages and some of the drawbacks of each type with that. And additionally, many of these mitten gauntlets actually underneath had little finger plates on the end of the fingers here, so the end of the fingers were protected. Um, and indeed, the mittens came in a variety as well. If we look at English mitten gauntlets, we often see they have articulations at the wrist, probably because the English, for example, were quite particular in their armour design, um, and they favoured fighting on foot. So possibly they sought a greater degree of mobility as well as protection in their gauntlets um, because they were fighting on foot so often with pole weapons, particularly the pole axe um, and the two-handed sword to some extent as well, and the spear. Um, so fighting on foot, you probably want more mobility, whereas the Italian armour, we could say, was optimised for horseback fighting. Okay, But that being said, these types of Italian gauntlets found their way all over Europe and are to be seen in English art, French art, Flemish art. German art and so on and so forth. So these were a very popular um, type of design. But you have to be aware that they have a huge amount of protection, but they also have some drawbacks in mobility. So bringing this back around to weapon use and particularly long swords or two-handed swords. Um, now, before I go straight into the long swords, I'm just gonna grab a one-handed sword. In this case, um, well, a one-handed sword. I could, I could have grabbed um, an ax. This really applies to um, any one-handed weapon. 
Now, when you use um, gauntlets like this, you have to be aware that you cannot move um, the sword in all of exactly the same angles when you've got gauntlets on, depending on the type of gauntlets, but pretty much any gauntlets. You don't have the full range of mobility that you do when you have gauntlets off. So people who are used to um, HEMA fencing or reenactment fighting or LARP or whatever, if you're used to using a one-handed sword in certain ways, you will find you have to modify the ways you use them once you stick a gauntlet on. Now there are lots of things you can do. A straight downwards cut is pretty much possible, but you'll notice there is an, uh, a maximum degree to which you can flex out the sword. If I just uh, get this gauntlet off, it's not that quick and easy to get off, I have to say, there we go. You will notice that um, without a gauntlet on, you can stretch the blade out a lot further and indeed if you stick the finger over the guard as the Italian sword and buckler fencers often did according to the art and of course we get finger rings being developed pretty um, in this period um, then you can extend the sword out and you can do rotations with it in ways that you can't necessarily do or you can't so easily do with um, gauntlets on especially depending on the cuff design uh, but just in general uh, any gauntlets you'll see that they're not that quick and easy to get on. Obviously these are new so the leather will loosen up a little bit. I have to say it's fairly supple, this isn't a review for these, but um, they're very well made gauntlets and the leather gloves are um, hand stitched in for me. Um, so absolutely you can still get some degree of rotation with uh, the gauntlet on, but it is less, you are more restricted. So you have to accept off the bat as soon as you put gauntlets on, there are restrictions in the angles and the way that you can move compared to not wearing gauntlets at all. So how does this um, relate to long swords specifically? Well, I guess there are two main points that I really want to make in this video. If I just put the one-handed sword down for a second. Um, I'm going to use a feather for this for illustrative, illustrative purposes. And initially I'm going to use one, as you see, this is a typical kind of modern uh, 21st century feather shirt or feather proportions or parrot shirt if you want to call it that um, proportions because it has a relatively long hilt now in HEMA we use protective gloves they are uh, in some senses not as protective as steel gauntlets uh, because you couldn't stab through these but you could stab through quite a lot of HEMA gauntlets with a sharp blade but HEMA gloves or HEMA gauntlets are designed to prevent against blunt impact trauma, essentially, while still giving you as much mobility or almost as much mobility as not having any gauntlets on at all. Steel gauntlets do restrict you more. They do way more, but of course they will protect you against a sharp pole axe in a way that a modern HEMA glove for the most part wouldn't. Um, now, when we grab a longsword, the very first limitation we find is there are angles that are uh, difficult or more restrictive to, to get in. So as mentioned, you can't flex the wrist as far forward or as far back as you could do without wearing gauntlets. So that does mean that yes indeed, ah, I mean I can sort of get to Ox up here and I could, I could sort of do a, a, a Zwerkau, but it's more restricted um, and it's more limited in my range of movement. In terms of Fiore's guards, I can do most of the guards pretty easily. I can do uh, Posse Donna La Destraza or uh, Sinistra um, uh, in either Volta Stabile. I could do uh, Posse Donna La Soprana. Um, I can do tail guard easily, full iron door. I know this is off camera. Middle iron door, Dente di Cinghiale. Posta Breve, Posta Longa, Posta di Baicorno. So I can do those guards fairly easily. The one that is tricky is anything that crosses the wrists. So Finestra is really quite tricky on that side. It's kind of fine actually on that side, okay? Um, equally, if I go to German sources, if I go to Vexel or Nebenhut, things like this, if I'm doing anything that crosses the wrists over, it becomes harder with gauntlets on because the, particularly this type of gauntlet, have large wrists which don't really want to be crossed over. So that's kind of one obvious limitation to wearing gauntlets. There are ways in which they interact with each, with each other which uh, and the wrist rotation which simply limit uh, the ways of using the sword. Now we have to also mention at this point, predominantly armoured fighting in the 15th century is shown half swording. Now funnily enough, although that, that might be the most effective way to use a sword in armour, I kind of partly wonder whether it's a chicken and egg situation as well because when you wear gauntlets of the time this is actually the easiest and most convenient and comfortable way of holding a longsword. The basic rule is the further apart your hands get the less of trouble it is the fact that you've got gauntlets on. So really with a pole axe, if I just grab the pole axe for a second, um, 
With a pole axe, it's really not too much trouble at all because the hands are further apart. So once the hands are up here, it, it doesn't really change an awful lot in how the two hands uh, interact because they're far apart. However, once you move the hands close on a weapon like a longsword, it starts to become more and more of a problem. And that is where we come to the second point and really the main reason that I wanted to throw this video up um, quickly. As I mentioned, feathers tend to have fairly long grips and that's partly to accommodate Hema sparring gloves and partly because some of the surviving feathers do have pretty long grips. Some long swords do as well, particularly in Germany. However, if we look at lots of uh, long swords, the so-called hand and a half swords from this period, they actually don't have very long grips, okay? There are plenty that have shorter grips than this example. In fact, I've been looking at some examples in the Royal Armouries, re Armouries recently in Leeds, taking measurements, and it is not uncommon at all for a longsword or bastard sword of this period to have a shorter grip than this replica here. Now, how does that relate to gauntlets? Well, quite simply, when you've got gauntlets on, particularly mitten gauntlets, but actually this does apply to fingered gauntlets as well, including hourglass gauntlets, when you put your hand on the sword, it now takes up a lot more of space on the grip than it did previously. So, when you put the second hand on, if you try to grip the grip only without gripping the pommel, there is barely enough space there to do that. Now what I end up doing, and this isn't a problem for me because I study Fiore and he doesn't say to do uh, otherwise, is that I grip the pommel. Now if I grip the pommel, you'll notice there's still some space between my hands. That being said, with a normal sized longsword, it does mean that essentially Fenestra is uh, its possible, but really uncomfortable, and I'm probably not gonna use it. The low guards, medium guards are fine. The high guards, absolutely fine. Um, obviously, half swording is absolutely fine, no problem at all. But there are certain techniques, uh, even just cutting from the left becomes awkward because of the way that the gauntlets interact with each other. Uh, anything which crosses the wrists over becomes unattractive to me as an option. So absolutely, a standard size longsword used with gauntlets, certainly gauntlets like these, but in my experience it applies to hourglass gauntlets as well, which I also own. It does affect how you use the sword, how you manipulate the sword. Now, this uh, actually has, this connects to quite a popular HEMA topic, which is how to grip a longsword. Um, now, my view, as you probably know from watching my channel, hopefully, my view is you grip it how you want to grip it. But there are sources, particularly the so-called Dobringer, um, which says to grip the handle or grip of the sword and don't grip the pommel. It explicitly says don't grip the pommel. Now, I have to say there are other sources, certainly Italian sources, which completely contradict that. Uh, for example, Vardi tells you to have a pommel that's of a size, uh, a size and shape that is nice in the hand. If we look at Fiore, we can see some people gripping, gripping just the grip. We can some people see some people gripping the pommel. I personally grip the pommel, okay? Now, um, if you are someone who only wants to grip the grip and has taught your students and taught yourself to never grip the pommel, that's going to be a problem if you put gauntlets on because quite simply you won't have space on a standard size longsword to fit gauntleted gloves both on the grip. Now admittedly, a lot of armoured fighting is done half-swording, but equally we also see people in armour holding the long sword like a normal sword. And if your opponent isn't in armour, you may as well use the sword like a normal sword and carve up the, the opponents in light armour or no armour, um, as case may be. And if you look at something like Fiore, you can see people using long swords gripped normally with both hands on the grip of the weapon with gauntlets with armour on. So therefore, I think that the people who are quite strict about not gripping the pommel need to be a little bit more liberal in their thinking when it comes to armoured fighting and when it comes to wearing gauntlets. There's another reason as well, so I'm just going to throw the gauntlets back on. Be partly because of the width, partly because of the uh, loss of sensitivity and subtleness, should we say, once you've got the gauntlets on. The other thing I find is once you're gripping a longsword, it's absolutely fine in the, in the right hand, okay? And you could use it as a, as a one-handed sword, no problem. When you want to bring the left hand up to go here, you actually find that if you anchor the top two fingers, the index finger and the ring finger, over the top, particularly if you've got a wheel pommel, but it works with a scent stopper pommel as well, if you put those two fingers over the top of the pommel, it gives a really nice anchored grip. And this does mean, if we look in here, that with those top two fingers over, 
the wheel pommel is now resting in the center of my hand, in the palm of my hand. Now, some people don't like the feeling of wheel pommels on the hand, but remember, these swords, knightly swords, were primarily designed for the battlefield, primarily designed to be used by people wearing gloves, and certainly by the 15th century, in gauntlets. So a wheel pommel that might be uncomfortable in your bare hand suddenly becomes very grippy and very comfortable in a gloved and gauntleted hand. So, I hope this gives you some uh, food for thought and some further ways to think about the interactions between armour and weapons. And very often people who collect long swords, even in HEMA, people that fence with long swords, don't necessarily consider the implications and the context of armoured fighting, the effects that armoured fighting has on the design and use of these weapons, and actually, Sometimes the way that we see these weapons used in unarmoured stuff can be influenced by the armoured stuff, as well as obviously vice versa as well. So understanding the armour and how the armour interacts with the weapons is very important to understanding the weapons themselves. Don't only view them in an unarmoured fencing context, because frankly, these weren't specialised unarmoured civilian dueling weapons yet. They're not rapiers, you know, they're not small swords. These are weapons which were designed primarily to be used by armoured people on the battlefield. Thanks a lot for watching, I hope this has been interesting. Uh, love to see your comments below and your views. Uh, obviously people out there will have different types of gauntlets to me, some people might have late 15th century German Gothic gauntlets, which offer less protection but arguably more mobility. Equally hourglass gauntlets win us in certain ways offer more mobility but they still take up as much space pretty much on a grip. Um, so I'd be interested to see your comments underneath here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope I'll see you back here soon. Cheers, folks.